Yes, I think that should be everybody in. The waiting room's closed. Anybody else will come straight in. So let's start with no further ado. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the latest uh, in the series of talks from the South Georgia Association. In the absence of our chair, David Drury, who's out tramping somewhere around the West Country, um, he sends his apologies. I don't know why, because we, I'm in the West Country and we do have internet here. He could have stopped in a pub somewhere. But uh, anyway, I'm here just to welcome you all to one more in our series of talks from the South Georgia Association. The SGA is the membership association for those with an interest in South Georgia and who want to keep abreast of what's going on and who care for it. If you're not a member already, do feel free to join through our website at southgeorgiaassociation.org. Bit of housekeeping to start with. Um, we'll have put you all on mute so that um, your children bursting in to tell you there's something interesting on the television won't crash our speakers this evening. And if you do have any questions, just put them in the chat and I'll have a look at them as we go and field as many as we can and give them to our talk because at the end, if they haven't already answered it. We've got two people speaking tonight. Um, Steve, Stephen Venables is a mountaineer and author who's been visiting South Georgia as a mountaineer and on yachts since 1989. And he's going to tell us a bit about crossing the island using the route that Shackleton took. And Robert Burton, Bob, is with us as well, a historian, and he was based at Bird Island back in the 1950s, so he's been associated with South Georgia for a long, long time. Um, he's going to give us a, a bit about the history and what happened at the landing spot before they started the, tri the crossing and what happened when they got to Stromness at the end of the crossing. So we'll get a, a bit of the whole story of, the, um, of Shackleton's route across the island. Um, yeah, we are recording it. So we hope to be able to put it on, um, on the website in a few days time for anyone who's missed it. Okay, well, if anyone knows of anyone who's trying to get in and can't, again, you can go to the South Georgia Association's website and there'll be a direct link now um, if it's not already full up. And I don't think we've got 500 yet, so that should be good. So without any further ado, I think I shall ask or invite Bob Burton to share his screen and tell us about Shackleton's arriving at South Georgia. Thank you. Yes, hopefully the technology will work. No. There we are. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone is muted, though I am rather put off by the people who are drinking. Um, I think with the story of the crossing of South Georgia, it's necessary to make the point first that this was accomplished after a horrendous two week crossing from Elephant Island. And there are three things which stand out. One, that the boat didn't sink on the way. Two, that none of the men died of uh, exposure. Um, in fact, if you want to read the, a really good uh, account of that crossing, read Frank Worsley's book called Endurance. He goes into great detail of all the privations and horrors they faced. And the third thing is that they actually got to South Georgia. They hit the, their destination. And that's thanks to Worsley's brilliance as a navigator. He only had four sunshots on the way across, and he was so confident that his idea was to actually go round the island. Um, <clears throat> he wanted to head round the West End and straight into the whaling stations. But Shackleton, who was known as Cautious Jack, said, no, if the weather's thick, we could miss the island and disappear into the Southern Ocean, never be heard of again. So steer a bit eastwards, and they made landfall at Cape Demidoff, which is just a nice sort of margin of safety. Um, Cape Demidoff is not a nice place. Here it is on a fairly nice day. 
Um, it was a lot worse when James Caird uh, hove in sight there. They could see the waves breaking on the cliffs um, and they wanted to get into the shelter of King Hawken Bay, just to the right. Um, <clears throat> which is there. Um, now, King Orkham Bay is guarded by reefs and little islets and so on, and night was coming on, and this was going to be very dicey. They could see the waves breaking on these obstacles. So they decided to stand out to sea for the night, and then they suffered the most horrific hurricane, which nearly did for them. They got blown down, almost crashing into Anankov Island, they were only held off by the backwash, but the waves bouncing off the cliffs. Um, but luckily, just as all seemed to be lost, the wind dropped and not for the first time, they thanked Providence for saving them. And in fact, Worsley, he gave Providence much of the credit for getting them to South Georgia. Old Provy, as Worsley called him. So they then made their way back up to King Hawken Bay. The wind changed as they entered it and they had to beat tacking to and fro, trying to make headway. They put the oars out one side of the boat to push it in. And eventually they saw this gap in the cliffs where they looked like a sheltered cove. This was not an easy entrance. This was on a nice day that I took the photo, uh, but you can see there's rocks and there's kelp and they had to feel their way in make sure they weren't being pushed off course by the waves and eventually got into safety. And this actually, uh, they didn't have a camera there, of course. This is a still from the IMAX film and the production team were very keen that that film should be as accurate a, as possible. And in fact, I think the actors were pretty seasick and feeling a bit uh, grisly when they came to this landing. But they see it's a nice day, there's no waves. When Shackleton and co got here, um, <clears throat> they were too weak to pull the boat up. They had to unload the ballast, take all their gear out. And even then they couldn't get it far up, even though it was being pushed by the waves. So they tied it to a boulder and they retreated to a cave. And this is Cave Cove, which is a bit of a misnomer. A rock overhang cove might be rather better. <laughs> because it's really not much of a cave. Uh, this is sketched by Worsley. You can see there's just room for them to huddle in their sleeping bags with a fire, and they fitted up the sails across the entrance to keep the weather out, really quite snug, particularly when they'd dug up a lot of tussock grass and made a nice soft floor. Um, <clears throat> they now had to uh, recover their strength, um, John Vincent, who was a North Sea trawlerman, he had totally cracked up. He was pretty useless. He just lay there smoking and stoking the fire. Chippy McNish, who was an old man at 50, um, he was also in a fairly bad state. So it remained to the remaining three, uh, Shackleton, Worsley and Tom Crean to actually do much. Um, they managed to get uh, the James cared higher up the beach to safety, partly by taking the top strakes off it, the ones that Chippy had put on at Ocean Camp to make it more seaworthy. And Shackleton and Worsley also um, did a reconnaissance. They climbed up the uh, tussock grass at the back uh, to prospect the place. And one thing they found was some nice fresh food. The wanderer chicks were still on their nests they stay on the nest right through the winter, slowly growing until spring, and they put on weight and fly off. And these were very good eating. They also killed an elephant seal and took the meat, some of the meat, the liver, which is a real delicacy, and they took some blubber as fuel. And they also scouted around, and you can see that there's 12 glaciers around King Hawken Bay, all going right down to the water's edge. Of course, nowadays they've retreated right back up inshore. Um, this meant that they couldn't trek to the inland and cross 
the island. Um, so they had to take the boat back higher up the uh, bay. Um, and incidentally, when they were getting the boat out, uh, hauling it out, the rudder got torn off and floated away, which was a big inconvenience. But as they launched the boat again, uh, they saw something bobbing in the waves. Crean rushed in up to his knees and it was the rudder. It had spent six days wandering around the Southern Ocean and had come back just when it was needed. So they set off up the bay. It was a nice day, the sun was shining and they found a good place to make another camp. Um, this rocky bluff here, which sheltered them from the wind, it was a nice flat beach, yeah. and it was relatively easy to get the James cared out and turn it upside down and establish a camp underneath it. And they called it Peggotty Camp, after the Peggotty family in Charles Dickens' uh, David Copperfield, who lived in an upturned boat, a very palatial one, compared to the James Caird. And once again, they were killing local food, building up their strength. Um, it's clear that only three of them would be able to get across the island. That's Shackleton, Worsley and Crean. Um, they did some reconnaissance, which wasn't very successful because of fog. But eventually, after I think it was four days, the weather cleared up and Shackleton said, right, we're off, we're going, we're going as soon as we can. So they had a meal and set off at three in the morning, heading across the island, hoping to get to Husvik. Um, as you know, in uh, Stromness Bay, there were three whaling stations, Leith Harbour, Husvik and Stromness, and they had decided Husvik was the best bet. Um, <clears throat> they also hoped, it's a rather a forlorn hope, that there would be a nice flat crossing. And of course, as we know, it was the most terrible countryside which Stephen will tell us about. And they set off, they were escorted a short way by Chippy, who then left them to go on by themselves. And off they went up onto the glaciers. And here I'll now hand you over to Stephen, who will tell us what this crossing is like. Now, oh, I should some be able to get rid of myself. I can't, oh, here we are. There, I hope you can see my screen now. Yep. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for reminding me. I, I, I always get a lump in my throat every time I re -hear that hear that story of that extraordinary landing. Well, now to the mountains. Uh, this This is the country that they had to cross. This is what they were faced with having, as Bob pointed out, uh, ended up on the wrong side of the island uh, through Shackleton's cautiousness. Uh, now they had to cross this extraordinary range of mountains. Uh, Kinghawken Bay is just uh, in there under the clouds in this, this picture I took from a, looking down from, from a high summit. And from there they set off on a journey which is, well, as the albatross flies, I think it's probably only 23 miles, but with all the twists and turns, let's say it's about a 30 mile journey across completely unknown, unmapped country into which no human being, as far as we know, had ever strayed before. Perhaps the odd sealer back in the, in the 19th century had, had looked up one of these valleys, but it seems pretty, pretty unlikely. Well, I've had a chance uh, to repeat that journey on several occasions and for some reason the pictures are not moving on so I just oh here we are now now, now we're in business um, I've had a chance to repeat that journey on several occasions uh, the first time was in 2000 when I took part in the IMAX film which uh, Bob mentioned briefly I was in the latter part of the of the filming and the idea was that three of us would repeat the journey across the mountains in the in, in April 2000 so in in, in the um, uh, in, 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 in the autumn at about the same time of year as Shackleton was doing it back in 1916 now for some reason the pictures are not moving on and I'm not quite sure why that is try it that way 
Well, here we are, the three of us, myself, Conrad Anker and Reinhold Messner. Uh, our job was, was basically just to walk across a glacier in the steps of these great pioneers. To do that, we had a lot of people to look after us, including some, some very experienced seasoned Antarctic hands, such as Nick Lewis, whom some of you may know, David Roots, uh, one of the founders of this society, and uh, Mike Sharp, all of who, whom now run Antarctic operations down on the, on the main continent of Antarctica. And the three of us set off on this extraordinary crossing. Well, on that occasion in 2000, we did it on foot and the glaciers were quite dry there wasn't much snow cover we had pretty burly weather uh, quite a lot of wind and rain and sleet and not ideal conditions i have since been back to do it on several other occasions thanks mainly to this man skip novak uh, the captain of pelagic australis a wonderful 75 foot yacht purpose built uh, for sailing in in the southern ocean uh, and I've done four trips, well, three trips now, uh, uh, repeating the Shackleton Crossing since that first one in 2000. Well, sometimes you set sail from the Falklands on that 800-mile crossing to South Georgia, and the weather is absolutely gorgeous, and you can see why people enjoy sailing. At other times, it's a little bit more burly and this was one occasion when we arrived with the decks quite well frozen up with frozen spray and nevertheless approaching in a purpose-built aluminium totally bomb proof 75 yacht is just incomparable with turning up in a 22 foot lifeboat um, in, in 1916 um, so really it's a very luxurious way of approaching the Shackleton Traverse. And here we are, coming ashore just actually just above Peckerty Bluff, right at the head of King Hawken Bay. This was in, in uh, October 2008, with a group mainly, mainly from Somerset and Devon who wanted to repeat uh, the famous journey across the glaciers. And that's looking up from the head of King Hawken Bay uh, up to the famous Shackleton Gap, over the other side of which lies Possession Bay. And you'll recall that when they set off at three o'clock in the morning in the night traveling by moonlight the three men made quite quick progress up to that that crest looked down the far side and thought they saw a frozen lake and only afterwards realized it was actually the moonlight glittering not on a, on, on ice but on the open ocean on possession bay and at that point they realized that they'd got to head east on what proved to be a very long and arduous journey all the way uh, to Stromness Bay. They didn't have skis. They experimented with a homemade sledge, but I don't think it really worked. And my God, how different it is to travel with skis, moving easily across the snow, uh, towing your luggage behind you, um, just a, totally comparable uh, to what they were doing back in 1916. Well, after several hours traveling across what's now called the Murray Snowfield, heading east from Shackleton Gap, you suddenly come up against this this first obstacle and in in, in Worsley's words uh, the snow upland over which we were traveling steepened ahead of us to a great ridge through which five rocky crags or nun attacks reared up like giant fingers with what looked like passes between each pair well i think shackleton mentions four nun attacks Worsley mentions five and I think they can be forgiven for the odd disparity in their in their 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 accounts written in Wesley's case several years after the event well we on all the trips I've done we've chosen to cross this pass here we think it might be the one they cross possibly they crossed the, the slightly higher pass on the left you will recall this in the account they kept going up to a pass looking down the far side staring down a terrible precipice and deciding to try the next one well, this is coming up to that pass which we've chosen, approaching a huge great, well, what Worsley described actually incorrectly as a Bergschrund. It's really a great scoop, very typical of the polar regions, I think caused by a, a combination of ablation where the glacier abuts against sun-warmed rocks and of the scooping effect of catabatic winds swirling around uh, the, these rock fingers, causing these immense great scoops, uh, which can be attractive as, as campsites, until you remember that they're probably caused by the wind. So we actually pitched our first camp 
on the, on the crest of this great scoop, where, uh, and which but Worsley had described as being big enough to contain at least two battle cruisers inside it. And then it's the next morning in 2008 that we looked from the crest of that, that ridge to, to the land ahead. And, well, this is a glorious, fine autumn, this fine spring morning, looking down onto what's now known as the Crean Glacier on the left is Antarctic Bay. In the far distance is the Great, Gun the great Nunatak, which um, Worsley referred to as the Great Dome-shaped Rock, about 10 kilometres to the east. Well, that's on a lovely spring morning. They arrived there late in the evening as it was starting to get dark on an autumn evening. They looked ahead and they could just make out that instead of the hoped for easy walk across the tussock grass, there was just this vast glacial hinterland with ice falls dropping down into the ocean and no chance of the hoped for easy walk around the coast. Basically, this was going to be full scale mountaineering. And first, of course, they had to get down onto what's now called the Crean Glacier. Well, the first time I was there in 2000, in April, in autumn conditions, after the, all the melt of the summer, it had changed totally, drastically, since the account of 1916. This is the slope, or nearby is the slope, down which those four men, uh, just throwing all caution to the winds, breaking all the mountaineering rules, set off to slide, helter-skelter, tobogganing down a convex slope, which is just something you never do in the mountains because you can't see what's below you. But they just went for it and they got away with it down this thousand metre slope. The great um, Tyrolean mountaineer Reinhold Messner, uh, with whom I was on this, this first crossing, he, he remarked afterwards that, that today, in these conditions, if, if a thousand men were to slide down this slope, they would all be dead, or maybe, maybe one would survive. And it really was, was quite gnarly, where we were actually going down very gingerly, roped up in crampons, eventually to get down onto what's now known as the Crean Glacier, where, in, in 1916, they had found a smooth passage across smooth snowfields. Well, by 2000, the isotherm had risen. Instead of smooth snow, we had bare ice and this hideous sort of maze of crevasses through which we had to thread our way, made more complicated by the fact that Reinhold, uh, on the evening of the first day, leaping across a crevasse, had broken his foot, uh, which to most people would be a reason to stop. Uh, in the case of Reinhold Messner, it was a reason just, just to carry on and grin and bear it. We did, thank God, have the luxury of a tiny little tent to shelter in as it started raining that night. But that, of course, was a luxury they didn't have in 1916. They had no shelter. They knew that if they got caught out by, by a storm, they would almost certainly perish. We could take our time, we could say, well, it is dark now, and even Reinhold Messner might agree that we'll put the tent up and have a bit of kip and carry on in the morning. Well, it took us 10 hours to cross that stretch, which you can see in this picture, which took them just five hours in 1916. Well, here we are in 2008 at the crest of what's sometimes called the Trident Ridge, about to set off down that thousand foot slope leading down to the Green Glacier. There she goes. There's a theory there, you know, when you get these poachers, you just let them go down. You know. What happened there? What happened there is a pulp fell down a crevasse. Again, they're incredibly lucky there was no open crevasse in 1916. Well, this is the slope down which we were lowering pulks very carefully. Uh, that's the slope thereabouts that they glissaded down in about a minute in 1916. In the recent, well, the, the previous Bass map of South Georgia, there seemed to be some confusion about what's known as the Trident Ridge and this ridge of Nunatax, which Worsley describes with the various coals. And then the three very significant peaks immediately to the south, which were known as, as the Trident, implying that it was just sort of one lump with three little points. Uh, to my mind, it's actually three discrete mountains. 
Uh, and Shackleton and Worsley certainly, and Crean, they certainly didn't go all the way between all those three great peaks. They came between the, the Nun attacks on the right. Um, but those peaks do look very exciting. And having done the Shackleton crossing three times, in 2014, I suggested to Skip, we, we, we had a team out there, I said, well, why don't we have a go have have a go at the Trident Peaks and so in this was in 2014 we made a little diversion to three peaks which after prolonged negotiation with the Antarctic Place Names Committee are now known after three sea gods, goddesses Mount Thalassa, Mount Poseidon, well a sea god not a goddess and Mount Tethys and we approached from Possession Bay, the bay into which Shackleton nearly descended in 1916, made our way up and then diverted from the regular Shackleton crossing and set off in pretty unpleasant conditions. But by the second afternoon, we arrived on, on a gorgeous afternoon and we were treated to the most beautiful sunset as we settled into our camp below the, the, the central peak of those three Trident peaks, which is now known as Poseidon. And the next day, we made the first ascent of that peak, six of us enjoying some quite exciting climbing to that summit. A, a glorious descent that afternoon, looking out eastward across the Esmark Glacier towards the Cole Larsen Plateau, um, another of those great wind scoops on the left there. Uh, th that actually is the route round the back which Shackleton and Worsley and Crean might have taken. It might actually be better, a better route. Certainly with modern skis it would be a, be a, be a pleasanter journey. Up um, on the right there, immediately to our south, was the south peak of the Trident, which uh, we, we called Thalassa, which we climbed the next day. And then to the north is Tethys, which we climbed on the third day in uh, more typical South Georgia conditions before returning to Pelagic Australis. But enough of that diversion, back to the Crean Glacier, as it's now known. This was 2008, glorious weather, um, serious problems with sunburn, it was just one of those blazing hot spring afternoons, gorgeous ski touring, looking back up at, you can just see the tracks of our descent where we'd load the pulk, the pulks. Up on the right, possibly is the coal that they slid down from in 1916. I think other people are perhaps more expert than me on the exact route they took. Maybe they came over one of those coals further left. I think it was one of the ones on the right. Anyway, there we are on the Crean Glacier, and again, with the luxury of saying at about tea time, well, why don't we just stop and spend the night here? It's a lovely afternoon, there's no rush, and let's just enjoy these glorious mountains. Very different to come as a tourist, but you're always aware of what can so easily happen on South Georgia and what the normal prevailing conditions are actually like. And what's so amazing is that they were never caught in a blizzard like that in 1916, in a, in a particularly harsh autumn they just hit it just right and were incredibly lucky with that 36 hour weather window ferocious conditions are the norm uh, on there as uh, as um, worsley wrote with um, a, a touch of melodrama the hell that rains up there in heavy storms the wind fiends thrown hissing snarling reverberating from crag to crag from peak to precipice hurtle revengefully onto ice sheets and carving biting gouging tear out great chunks and lumps of ice to hurl them volcanically aloft great stuff well that's fairly normal for south georgia and um you will know, you will remember that in 1982, during the retaking of the island from the Argentines, there were some serious dramas here with the SAS, and no less than two helicopters crashed, one of them on the Fortuna Glacier, which for many years became a, a curious landmark uh, for teams um, of tourists like me, repeating the Shackleton Crossing. And things, of course, can go wrong. This is a, a, a quite a committing journey through very remote mountain country. When we were there um, in 2016, Craig Jones and I were, were, were taking a, a team of four across the crossing and we'd almost got to the bottom of the big descent, which looks actually fairly innocuous looking back up here. It's a thousand feet of actually quite steep snow and ice. And right 
at the bottom of that that descent uh, just as we were getting the camp ready one member of the team unfortunately uh, basically got run over by her pulk and twisted a knee actually fractured got a nasty fracture of the knee in this very very remote exposed place uh, at the, probably at the most committing point of the whole route having just descended a thousand feet from the trident ridge uh, and the irony was this was this was Eileen Crean, the great, the granddaughter of Tom Crean, exactly a hundred years after Tom Crean had himself slid down that slope. And it was, a, of course, a huge disappointment. She was here after the centenary with her two sons to repeat this famous crossing. Well, it was a serious situation. Uh, after camping that night, early in the morning at dawn, Craig and I, uh, just skied down to Antarctic Bay, just wondering if we might be able to do an evacuation into Antarctic Bay. Got there, looked down and thought, no chance. Four virtual mountaineering novices, a serious casualty, trying to get down those very steep slopes into that Serac-threatened bay. No, this is just, just out of the question. So we, we radioed through to the boat, Pelagic, to say we, we'll have to make go all the way to Fortuna Bay. We got back to camp and, and a breakfast. We told Eileen, well, you are actually going to do the, the, the Shackleton Traverse. It's just you're going to have to do it on your back and we're going to have to pull you. So we got all packed up and we set off on the big haul across the Crean Glacier and the 1916 snowfield. And quite a journey it was. Uh, and we camped over on the Fortuna Glacier after a long day's hauling and the next day continued uh, down to, to a side chute of Fortuna Glacier into Fortuna Bay. Total journey of 16 kilometres um, hauling Eileen. And uh, I, as, as, as nominal leader of the team, I felt, well, I guess it's my responsibility. Uh, you know, I'm in ch I, I should take responsibility for this. So I did most of the hauling, but in this picture, Craig Jones has actually uh, taken a stint uh, hauling, hauling the blood wagon uh, with her, with her Eileen's two sons and and her boyfriend, uh, bringing the remaining pulks. And then, on the second afternoon, we made it down to Fortuna Bay, and Eileen had to suffer the indignity of, being, of, of now being trussed up with 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 very secure slings, uh, and then manhandled onto the Zodiac, which uh, the, the the skipper. Alec, Alec Hazel very skillfully negotiated through some quite choppy water back to Pelagic and uh, and then uh, using the main halyard Eileen was was winched up onto, onto Pelagic got her, got her up onto the foredeck and eventually she was taken feet first down to the forepeak hatch and into a nice warm cosy bunk waiting down down below so we felt quite pleased that a potentially pretty serious situation uh, um, had been had been managed sex successfully, and Eileen was eventually got back to Gritvik and um, a great good fortune HMS Clyde happened to be calling, and they were able to take her in rather more comfort than, than we could offer on the 800 mile passage back to the Falklands. Well, back in 1916, amazingly, there were no blizzards, no one hurt themselves but it was the most arduous journey. And they made their way over what's now called the Crean Glacier, the 1916 snowfield. And it was at 11 o'clock at night, according to Worsley, that they stopped to, to brew up and make some hoosh at just below what he called the great dome-shaped rock. And then from there, uh, they continued over down onto the Fortuna Glacier. Well, it's amazing the, the, the navigation they achieved with no map, because there wasn't a map then. I think they had possibly had a coastal chart which showed nothing of this interior. This is their amazingly accurate rendering afterwards of, of, of the country they travelled through. And there, circled in red, is, is, is the Great Nunatak, Attack, the Great Dome-shaped Wreck Rock. Beyond that, they descended the Fortuna Glacier and headed towards a bay where, as Shackleton remarked, Late at night, they looked down into this bay and he wrote afterwards, I suppose our desires were giving wings to our fancies. 
for we pointed out joyfully various landmarks revealed by the now vagrant light of the moon, whose friendly face was cloud-swept. So they thought they'd actually made it to Stromness Bay, but then our high hopes were soon shattered. Crevasses warned us that we were on another glacier. They could see a great icefall descending to this bay, which clearly was not Stromness Bay. Thinking they couldn't get down there, they then made their way back up the Fortuna Glacier, eventually to cross uh, what's become known as Breakwind Ridge. And here we are in, I think, 2008, coming up to Breakwind Ridge, uh, comfortably clad with our nice modern skis, pulling our pulks with our tents and our food and our stoves, and all very comfortable. Well, back in 1916, they were travelling, I think two of them had Finnesco. I think Shackleton had given his warm reindeer boots to one of the other men, and he was just travelling in some light leather boots. They had no crampons, they, they had wooden staves for what they called alpenstocks, they had no proper ice axe, just the carpenter's ads. They had a short length of mountaineering rope, uh, and probably not a great deal of expertise about how actually to use it. But above all, what the one thing they did have was the Primus stove and some, some sledging supplies, some sledging rations. And the great secret to their success throughout the whole of this great epic was that they always stopped, got out the stove and had something hot, uh, according to Worsley, scalding hot, actually warming up their bodies and replenishing the lost calories. Great for the physiology and great for the morale. And so they actually stopped again uh, to brew up just below Breakwind Ridge and then famously Shackleton let the others have a little kip before making their way up to the ridge itself, which he described uh, he described as a gap, like, 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 like the gap left by a missing tooth. And we think this is probably the gap that they went through. And of course it was from there that, that Shackleton, as they were preparing breakfast, looked eastward, looked across an intervening ridge and then in the distance could make out uh, the, zigz the, the, f the familiar zigzag formations of some, some folded rocks above Stromness Bay, which they'd noted, noted 18, month earlier, 18 months earlier when they had set sail in the Endurance from, for Antarctica. Well, they still had to get down to Fortuna Bay. And so to the beach. Well, this is the route down from that notch, which we think is probably the route they, they took, but maybe they came over another toll, the coal. Maybe they came down that way. Maybe they went even further up the Fortuna Glacier and came down that coal, which would be a fantastic ski descent, but I don't think I'd fancy doing it pulling a sledge. Either way, they got down and that could have been the route because that comes directly down to where the Fortuna Glacier, the, sorry, the Koenig Glacier would have been in 1916. The Koenig Glacier has now retreated a long way up that valley. This, this landscape has changed drastically, of course. And now where there was the Koenig Glacier, there are, there, there's dry shingle uh, interrupted by the, the river outwash from the Koenig Glacier, uh, which is a nice little sting in the tail, bitterly cold glacial water, uh, almost at the end of this um, this 30 mile journey. And then there's the final climb up over the last ridge leading to, leading to Stromness Bay. Uh, and on, on that journey you pass the little tarn where, according to one account, Shackleton fell through the ice and got wet. In another account, it was Tom Crean who fell through the ice. Just a, a, a final little sort of icing on, on the cake of this extraordinary epic drama. Well, it was very moving in 2016, after we got Eileen back to Gritviken to return for the, 
to do the final section of the crossing with her two sons and for them to stand on the frozen tarn where either Shackleton or their great-grandfather had, had almost drowned falling through the ice at the conclusion of this extraordinary 18 months long epic voyage and, and eventually mountain crossing and then of course very moving to get up to that final pass and for them to be photographed looking down into Stromness Bay where their great-grandfather had concluded that extraordinary journey a hundred years earlier and again it's 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 always a lump in the throat throat moment I've done it four times now and you come over and you look down into Stromness and we as tourists um, can just try to imagine the extraordinary emotion as Shackleton and Crean and Worsley looked down there and and the emotion actually slightly earlier when they heard they heard the factory hooter and realized they nearly made it and, and and famously Shackleton wrote afterwards that never had any of us heard sweeter music it was the first sound created by outside human agency that had come to our ears since we left Stromness Bay in December 1914 and it was now May the 17th 1916. Well here we are coming down past the waterfall, the famous waterfall down which apparently they abseiled. Why on earth they chose to come that way I just cannot imagine when all around are comparatively straightforward slopes leading down to Stromness Bay. All I conclude, can conclude is that uh, they thought that maybe that this, this journey that wasn't quite hadn't been quite exciting enough and they needed fine one final little twist in the tail uh, to, to, to sell the book rights and the film rights uh, quite bizarre anyway from there it's only a short walk across the flat to arrive at Stromness where here we can be seen here um, celebrating just outside the Stromness whaling station and I'm now going to hand back to Bob just to to round off the story with 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 that the the, the final return uh, to, to Stromness. Well, I'll take it up. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, rather you than me. I prefer the, the coastal route. Um, th this is the famous Z folded rocks that they saw from the top of Breakwind Ridge. And the reason that they knew it was that Endurance had come from Griptick and Round to Leith Harbour in 1914, and they'd spotted it. And it was so worthy of note that Hurley got his camera out to take this photograph. And it's obviously imprinted on the minds of of Shackleton and the others that this was on Busan Point at the head of Stromness Bay and it showed them they're on their route and this is the z-shaped strata and I like to tell geologists this is the only interesting rock formation on South Georgia and they like to tell me that I know nothing about the subject uh, stick to history so this brought them on their way we've heard how they went round the uh, round Fortuna Bay and up the slope over the Crean Tarn and then down the waterfall and this is the view from the top of the waterfall and I think well they said the reason why they went down through the waterfall was that the only other way was to go back up the ravine and they just didn't have the strength to do it so being seamen they thought sliding down a rope wouldn't be a problem and in fact it wasn't and they were already wet, they couldn't get any wetter. And they then headed for the whaling station at Stromness, which is there. And cruise ships come in now. Uh, the, the whaling station is closed for safety reasons, but passengers can come ashore and walk up this river to the base of the waterfall and gaze at it in awe. But I think um, that our heroes didn't go down the riverbed. I think they went across here because Hurley writes that um, they reached some snow covered hills over which we traveled for half a mile, followed by marshy flats. 
and that better describes that route. It's only a little detail, really, but interesting. And then I think I've got more confirmation they came in that way because this is the approach to Stromness whaling station, photo taken in 1913. It's quite a small setup in those days. Uh, it's now a huge place. Um, and when Shackleton arrived, there was this three master there at the jetty. So they headed for it. And this is what it, well, didn't really look like. This is a model of Stromness whaling station in the Sandefjord Whaling Museum in Norway. And you see it's very much larger. There's all these tanks for whale oil and fuel oil. Um, and Shackleton must have come in this way because while I was looking at this model, which you can see is behind glass, um, someone came up to me and he, he said, which is the boiler house? And I said, this place with the tall factory chimney. And he said, well, his grandfather was standing in an open doorway when Shackleton and his companions walked just past him. He could have reached out and touched them. And I said, oh, did he get Shackleton's autograph? No, that's all he knew was that his grandfather had been standing there when Shackleton came past. But they would have come that way and were heading towards the jetty where the three master was tied up. And there was a, a, a group of men um, <clears throat> working there, loading or unloading the boat. And Shackleton came down here and approached the foreman um, and said, uh, uh, I'd like to see Captain Anderson. Um, and the man said, well, my name's Anderson. Um, no, Shackleton said, no, um, I mean Anton Anderson, the manager. And there's a chap who happened to be Matthias Anderson. And he uh, said, do you know him? And Shackleton said, yes, um, well, and, um, Captain Anderson is no longer here as manager. He's been replaced by Toral Sir. And Shackleton said, oh, I know him too. Can you take us to him? Well, this sequence of events, which is the, the real dramatic conclusion of their journey, they actually make it to safety. It's been described by several people, actual eyewitnesses amongst others, and all the stories are different. And this is what history, why history is such a difficult subject, because you have to try and work out who is telling the truth who has just got muddled and who is downright inventing things. And there is an eyewitness account from Anderson in a Norwegian newspaper. He was interviewed by a reporter, but the report is clearly mainly a work of imagination by the reporter. Um, Anderson is reported to say that he hears a shout and looks up and there's two young lads running as fast as their legs can carry them, frightened. And behind them come three figures slowly towards him. Well, both uh, Shackleton and Worsley say, yes, they did scare two youths, 17 or 18 years old, presumably mess boys. Uh, so that, well, in fact, the reporter may have actually read Shackleton's account. And so he learnt that uh, via Shackleton. But then Anderson says that they had long, thick beards, hair long down over their shoulders like women, Edwardian women, very long hair. They hadn't clothes like seamen, that's ordinary suits. They were dressed in weird, raggy anoraks. Their faces were almost black, only their eyes shone white. Well, there's a brilliant bit of invention um, <clears throat> because this photograph was taken by Hurley um, at Cape Valentine on Elephant Island when they first landed. Um, and here's Shackleton with fairly short hair. And in six weeks, which was the time it took to get to Stromness, hair would not have grown so long as those of us who failed to get a haircut during the lockdown are aware. And also they were wearing balaclamets but Bala, sorry, balaclava helmets like Walter Howe, the seaman who's wearing there. So their hair couldn't even be seen. So that's definitely a, a fabrication. And as you go through this account, you really have to pick which story you like, which is the most dramatic, I think. I have my favorite. 
Um, so Anderson takes them around to the manager's villa there to see Thurla. And here is here it is now, rather a sad state. There are still hopes it may be preserved from falling down. Um, <clears throat> they are agreed that uh, Anderson leaves the three outside and goes in and tells Serla there's some strange looking ragged men outside who say they know you. So Serla comes to the door and apparently he says, who the hell are you? That's one account, um, but he probably said it in, in Norwegian. Vemir Helvet Ardu in a Norwegian accent. Anyway, I imagine just the context and the, his tone of voice um, gave the lie as to what he was thinking. And Shackleton says, my name is Shackleton. And Serla says, come in, come in, come in. And Shackleton says, I'm afraid we smell. Never mind, this is a whaling station. We're used to it. And they're ushered into the manager's parlor and sat down. And this is one of the incredible parts of the journey, actually, because they sit in comfortable, easy chairs for the first time in 18 months in a room that's heated by a coal stove. And they've just done 36 hours non-stop horrendous trekking and they don't fall asleep. And that's because they're transfixed by Serla telling them what's been happening in the war. You recall that endurance set off at the outbreak of World War I. It's now two years into it. And Serla has to explain about things like poison gas, trench warfare, U-boat warfare. And of course, these three men, they've never heard anything like it. I mean, wars have never been like that. And that keeps them alert for a bit. Meanwhile, Serla's steward is rushing around. Um, he goes and gets some suits of clothes from the slop chest and then runs a bath so they can have their bath up here. And before Stromness was closed, this used to be a place of pilgrimage. Go and get your photograph taken sitting in Shackleton's bath. Hopefully it will have once again become a, a good tourist hotspot. Um, after their bath, they shave, dress, sit down to a lovely dinner. Meanwhile, the uh, whale catcher Samson is raising steam and Worsley joins them on board and they go around to pick up the three men at King Hawken Bay. Shackleton and Crean retire to bed and um, <clears throat> they have these marvelous soft beds, which actually they have difficulty getting to sleep because they're so soft. And then the next day, Serla takes them round to Husvik where there's a large British owned whale catcher the southern sky, it's laid up for the winter, but the Norwegians immediately set to and prepare it for open sea. And um, Shackleton and uh, Green spend the night there at Husvik and the manager there, uh, Søren Bernson, he writes to his wife saying, you never believe it, but Shackleton has just turned up having crossed the mountains of South Georgia. And he said that he heard the two of them crying out at night as they were reliving the ordeal of crossing the island. And that's a little hint on just the, the toll it took on the, the, the party, the three of them. Um, then they get the uh, southern sky going. They go around to Leith Harbour, where Samson comes in with the three men from King Hawken Bay and Worsley, and someone takes their photograph. Um, there's two prints of this photo. The glass negative um, got destroyed. Um, originally, when they first got to Stromness, Shackleton asked uh, Serla whether they could take his, their photographs. And Serla said, sorry, I've run out of film. And Worsley says, and that way the world lost a photograph of its three dirtiest men. And I thought, tell that to the soldiers in the mud of Flanders. Um, someone else did have a camera. They've got this picture and it's Crean on the left, Shackleton in the center, and a close look at the print. You can see the lower half of his face is pale where he's removed his beard. Who this is has long been a question mark. Um, someone suggested it was Frank Wilde because of the narrow face and small stature, but 
he's on Elephant Island, can't be him. Is it Worsley? Well, Worsley should be in a, a new suit of clothes like the other two. And he's wearing, still wearing his expeditionary kit. Well, recently, uh, the conversation with the family of John Vincent, they've unearthed some photographs of him. And it seems very likely it was John Vincent, the, the trawlerman. Um, but that is not the James Caird. There's lots of boats like this at the whaling stations. I think it's just a pity that the photographer didn't wait and get all six men. So we've just got three. But, and that really comes to the end of our story. Um, Crean, Shackleton and Worsley go on board the Southern Sky on the first attempt, first of four attempts to relieve Elephant Island. The other three and James Caird are taken back to England in the ship Orwell. And really, I'd like to finish on one thing, one strange phenomenon that um, Shackleton, um, <clears throat> now I've gone and lost my place now. Um, it doesn't seem to be working. Now Shackleton um, describes how on the crossing of South Georgia, he says, when I look back at those days, I have no doubt that Providence, or probably again, guided us not only across those snow fields, but across the storm white sea separating Elephant Island from our landing place on South Georgia. I know that during the long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. And then he adds that later, comparing notes with the other two, they all agreed with the same idea, that they'd seen some strange presence with them. And this intrigued me. I mean, what was it? Did they concoct it between them as, as a nice story or what? Well, Shackleton puts that in his book, South. He also mentioned it in lectures and it seems to have struck a chord with the public. And this is the front page of the Church Army Gazette in 1920, four years after the event, and rather a, a nice artist's impression of the crossing party. And you can see the shadowy form of the fourth man, three men or four. Sir Ernest Shackleton, the great Antarctic explorer says, I know. Well, what's all that about? And it was also taken up by T.S. Eliot when he was writing The Waste Land, which is arguably the most important poem or poem in English in the 20th century. And there's this little passage here. Who is the third who always walks beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. And <clears throat> this became known as the third man factor. And it goes through the ages and eventually um, it was John Geiger wrote a book called The Third Man Factor in which he gathered together instances of this phenomenon. And um, it's, it, it's something which seems to be experienced not that rarely by people who are undergoing extreme physical and mental stress. So it's seen amongst climbers, to which we can add Shackleton and co, um, uh, explorers, polar explorers out on their own, lone yachties, um, Charles Lindbergh, when he flew across the Atlantic, he had a presence in the cockpit with him. Um, and also um, of shipwreck sailors, or variety of people. And it is most bizarre. Um, is it, what, what is it? What is it? Is it some strange supernatural event? Um, no, so we, because we're very prosaic. Um, is it some unusual psychological relief mechanism? Or is it just old 
Provi um, manifested. Well, I can't talk about it. I've never gone in for survival situations. We have someone here who has, and that's the end of my story. And I will say good night and hand you back to Stephen. Well, I'll, um, um, uh, I hope you can hear me. I'll, I'll only add to that very briefly. Um, the, the, the famous, well, the famous quote in, in the wasteland, um, the white road, and, and in that case, it's a third person, not a fourth person in T.S. Eliot's account. He was apparently um, struck by Shackleton's story. Um, the, the poem also has, well, it has a huge number of references. That, that particular passage also alludes to, I think it's in the Acts of the Apostles, when Christ is walking with well, some of his apostles are walking, that's right, are walking along a road in Canaan, and then they sense this presence of another person beside them, and it's, it's the resurrected Christ. Um, so that, that, that's, that those are some of the, the, the cultural illusions. Uh, Bob says, I've, I've experienced, yes, I think, I think all of us who've, who've been in extreme situations of of great tiredness, exhaustion, hunger, are very prone to that very strong sense of, of just thinking someone else is there who isn't. The, the Everest climber Frank Smythe in 1933, alone at about 28,000 feet near the summit of Everest, he famously actually turned around to offer a piece of chocolate to his companion before suddenly thinking, well, that's a bit silly because actually <laughs> there's no one there. Uh, it is it is a, a very common phenomenon in situations of extreme stress. In the case of Smythe on Everest, that was probably accentuated by hypoxia because he wasn't getting much much to breathe at 28,000 feet. Uh, my own experience uh, also on Everest at similar altitudes was a very, very strong sense, a fleeting sense that came and went, but of, of someone else being there. And it's almost, I feel like, it's almost like your better half, someone there who's like a sort of guardian angel, someone who's urging you to be cautious, someone who needs looking after, and therefore you think, well, I must be careful, I must look after this person, in my case, an old man. I was quite young at the time. Uh, and, and maybe it is some kinds of built-in psychological defense mechanism for our own safety. Maybe it's just some chemical reaction of, of the brain severely starved of nourishment, uh, just very prone to psychic experiences. I don't know, but it is, it, at the time it feels very real and, and it, is, it is quite common. Anyway, I think uh, I've talked quite long enough um, and um, I should stop now and ask Pat whether we have any questions. Great, thank you both very, very much. That's fascinating. Um... Yeah, really nice to share that journey across with you. And we do have a couple of questions. Um, so I'll do them in, in order. First of all, Val K, which I think is probably Val Kerr, she was asking, has the ice loss made the journey across the island more difficult or less difficult, Stephen? Ah, well, Pat, you've also done this crossing, so you, you probably also have ideas about that. Um, I think... I don't know about the ice loss. I think the fact when we went there in autumn, we were, were in April, uh, Shackleton Co. did it in May, the Crean Glacier was completely bare of snow. That's not so much the, the, the shrinking of the glacier, it's the fact that, that there was no snow cover to, car to cover over the crevasses. And that did make it very difficult. Um, possibly the shrinking of the ice around that slope down which they tobogganed has made it steeper and more dangerous i suspect um interestingly the when they when they got to the fortuna glacier and looked down and realized they hadn't reached stromness bay and went back up they looked down and saw a glacier descending into fortuna bay this was at night time but there was moonlight and they looked down and they thought they couldn't get down there 
you now can get down there quite easily. I've done it twice, once with Reinhold Messner who'd broken his foot and then with, with poor Eileen who'd broken her knee. And that was avoided going over Breakwind Ridge. So, so Shackleton could have got down there more easily, but maybe in 1916, the glacier was, was, was a much vaster mass of ice. Maybe it, it formed a big ice fall. So the changes could have worked both ways. Great, thanks very much. Yes, I haven't actually done the Shackleton Crossing, but oh, oh of course you've you, well, you've just just done the entire traverse of the entire island. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that was in oh, 1999, and certainly the route that we took, which is probably the only real well, there are a few bits you could do, but the route that we took um, is the only way where you could do it in a couple of places. Glaciers have now receded, particularly the Neumar Glacier in Cumberland West Bay, and the Hamburg and Harker glaciers. At the end of Moraine Field, where we were where we were able to cross those, they're just open water now, and the Hamburg Glacier has receded just to steep cliffs each side. So, the the traverse that we did along the length of the island just couldn't be done um, along that route anymore. We have another question. Um, I'll read this one out. It's a nice long one from Carlos Stephen. I am one of your admirers uh, admirers of your work, writings, and journeys. Could you explain briefly your motivation to have done the crossing of South Georgia, not only one, but several <laughs> times? What, <laughs> or, <coughs> who or what does Shackleton represent for you? Hugs from Jay. <laughs> right. OK, I'll try and be brief. Um, well, I first, as you pointed out, Pat, I first went there uh, in 1989 to 1990. I thought I'd never go back to South Georgia. And then in 2000, I was invited to take part in that film. And it was a chance to return to South Georgia, which is a magical place. Uh, I was paid, which was an incentive. And uh, the, the director, George Butler, who'd previously made a documentary about Arnold Schwarzenegger, said, I'll make you as famous as Arnie. Alas, that didn't happen. <laughs> so, so that was the motivation in 2000. But obviously, I was fascinated to, to, to actually see the terrain for myself. And then subsequent crossings I've done either with or for Skip Novak's pelagic expeditions. And it's been groups of people who want to do it. And it's been, you know, partially a job of work, but more importantly, it's been just hugely enjoyable. Um, the people who come with us, for them, it's a, it's a really big deal. It's, it's so moving to, to experience that journey and uh, and it's very enjoyable yeah and and to a certain extent it it has a wilderness quality that many other wildernesses don't in as much as when you get into trouble as you did with eileen in particular you can't just pick up a device press a red button and the helicopter arrives to get you out of it you really are on your own and you do have to get yourselves out which is quite rare i think don't you Yes, and there are not many places in the world exactly where you can't call up a helicopter. I mean, they're now rescuing people from Everest and K2 and places by helicopter, but there are no helicopters in South Georgia. The nearest helicopter is 800 miles away, and you really are on your own, um, which is why actually expeditions nowadays always have to have a dedicated support vessel, um, hence going with Pelagic Australis. Yeah, amazing. We have another question. Actually, this this is from Sarah, who's behind the scenes, Sarah G, who's operating all the knobs and making sure that they, this whole talk's working. And she was asking, are the accounts of the third man factor in the book all post Shackleton or are there any other others other than the Bible that are pre Shackleton? Um, Bob, you've, is Bob there? Because he's read the Geiger book probably more recently than, than me. Um, I don't think so. I certainly read it long enough ago to not be able to remember right i think yes. oh yeah no I'm, I'm, i think there certainly have been uh people since shackleton well I'm, i know i've been quoted in it so it's certainly post shackleton but yeah uh, pre shackleton is the oh sorry pre shackleton yeah. well is 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 not joshua slocum quoted in it perhaps probably the first sounds likely just so sail alone around the world um I think there are pre Shackleton people, but we're sorry, we're vague on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we'll go on to the next question. Amongst all the other lovely, very kind messages from people 
saying how nice it all is. That's great. Um, yeah, so Tony's mentioning that Duncan Cass mentions a very similar um, phenomenon in his, in his book or in his memoirs of living in King Harkon Bay. Um, yeah, so he, yes, he did that experiment on living alone around on the south coast in the 1960s. There's in fact a video that he made at the time, a film that he went back a, a couple of years later and made, which you can get on YouTube via the South Georgia Association's website, U YouTube channel. I wish I got a pound every time I'm, I got to um, plug the, he the website. It'd, uh, it'd uh, be great. It. But, <laughs> thanks. Um, so yeah, so, so it's there on YouTube, um, casted that, all that amazing work as well. I'll have a quick look at anything else. Yeah, Joshua Slocum mentions the pilot. Mm. And you refer to Cautious Jack, but do you think approaching South Georgia on the other side of the island would have been possible given the state of the weather, the men and the James cared? So yeah, being cautious and going for the hard side, but that was probably the only option, was it, Bob? I think uh, Shackleton was afraid they'd get blown away, but blown out to sea. I suppose if they'd managed to hug, hug the shore, but certainly his view was that it, it was better to get ashore. Also, they were pretty well dying of thirst at the time, so a landing was imperative, even if they subsequently relaunched and went round. Um, incidentally, while I'm here, so I've just seen someone flag up that they were on a joint service expedition in 1982. I'd like to get in touch with such person because a friend of mine now dead was on it. Oh. Yeah, there's and there's another questions. one from the joint services in 64, 65 as well. Oh, so. yes, there's Patrick Fagan. Was oh, it's pa there. Patrick Fagan. Hello, Patrick. <laughs> Good. Well, good to see everyone. Um, all right. Uh, that's about it for questions. So thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, fascinating talk. Thanks very much, Bob and Stephen. Um, as I said, that has been recorded and the little red button says it's still recording. So I'll get that up onto the website in the next couple of days and you can point all your friends to it and go back and, and relive it. Our next talk we're holding will be in three months time on the 18th of November. And that will be about savoring, saving wandering albatrosses, not only from the likes of Shackleton eating them, but more the privations that they're suffering these days at the hands of um, fisheries worldwide. And Stephanie Prince, who works very closely with um, the Save the Albatross Fund and the RSPB on that, on that uh, exact project of trying to prevent albatross mortalities worldwide, she'll be talking along with uh, her colleague Yasuko Suzuki from Japan about a project that the South Georgia Association has helped to fund to persuade fishermen in the Far East to lay off the albatrosses a bit, which will be um, very interesting. And again, there's a, uh, there'll be the details for that on the website and we'll e email all our members nearer the time with how to get onto that. Um, but that leads me to a bit of good news that some of you might have spotted recently on Bird Island, where they're continually monitoring the wandering albatrosses. They've just done their 1st of August chick census and have got 558 wandering albatross chicks, which compared to five, oh no, it was 558 in April, and there are still 538 left. So that's 96% have survived, which is a, a very good survival rate this year. Um, they also noted that the the count that they did earlier in the year, that count of 558 chicks, was an increase over last year and also an increase over the year before, which is more interesting because they breed every two years. So it looks as though it's the downward spiral hasn't quite continued at the moment, although we're not out of the woods yet. So let's, um, yeah, well, let's look forward to hearing from Stephanie and Yasuko about how the, that work will continue to save the albatross. Well, hand up. Oh yes, there's a hand up. I shall have a quick look through. Uh, thank you, 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 thank you. Oh, I like this. Laura Block. Oh yeah, no. Oh, David Brooke. 
Is, is there someone who's got a question? Just pop out and unmute yourself and Flora, let us hear. Flora, a hand up. Oh, hi, Flora. What can we do for you? <laughs> yeah, hello, Flora. Talk to us. I'm Flora, but I'm Bill. Oh, hello, Bill. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Hi, Bill. I'm using my wife's iPad. It was just to say, uh, express appreciation for the uh, the two marvellous talks we've had tonight. I think it's been a very, very great evening and a, quite a watershed, I think, in our in our presentations by the SGA. Oh, thank you. Great. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Well, I shall leave it at that then. So thank you very much once again to Bob and to Stephen. And also a big, big round of applause to um, Sarah. Yes. Green. Yeah, with Sarah behind Sarah G behind the behind the scenes, who's made sure everything works. So, um, very very many thanks, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.